And what we're going to talk about today, uh, broadly speaking, are do online environments and video games have a place in undergraduate general education? Uh, but we're going to do that by talking about a specific example, and that's the use of a video game in a class, and the members of that class are here. So if you could raise your hand if you're in the class, just to get a sense. Okay, great. Um, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this panel to begin with and introduce the, the panelists that we have here today. Um, then I'm going to talk briefly about um, the general topic of video games and education, and I'm going to introduce our use of a game in our class and talk about the specific details of that. Um, after that, we'll have um, reflections on that point from the teaching staff who taught in the class, um, and also we'll have some readings of student work produced as a result of the class assignment. Um, finally, we'll end with commentary from um, our distinguished professor, Carrie Karahelios. Uh, and then we'll open the floor to uh, debate uh, and discussion. Um, so let me start by introducing who we have here today. As I said, my name is Christian Sandvig. I'm the professor of the class in question, which is called Communication, Technology, and Society. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in speech communication. And I should say, I'm also, um, I'm also a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study this year. And I would like to thank the Center for Advanced Study for sponsoring uh, my work on this project and this event. Um, on our panel, we have uh, the teaching staff for the class, starting on your left. Um, Matt Yipshayan is an MFA student in art and design, uh, and he uh, is specializes in the design of technologically mediated <coughs> social spaces. Um, he's part of the Social Spaces Research Group uh, in Human Computer Interaction here at UIUC, and uh, his research group recently exhibited an interactive installation about online presence at the San Jose Museum of Art. And he's previously taught time-based media uh, in art design and introduction to design in the computer science department. Uh, he's a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design with a BFA in animation. Um, next over, we have um, Siddhartha Sid Raja, a fourth year PhD student in speech communication. Um, Sid has a Bachelor of Science in Telecommunications Engineering from the University of Bombay, a uh, Master's of Science in Management Science and Engineering from Stanford, and he's participated in the um, Oxford Cardozo program in comparative media law and policy. He's interested in the politics of development, and uh, just recently he returned from working with the Federal Telecommunications Regulator of India. Um, and he's also a research assistant in my own research group and uh, writing his dissertation right now. And um, finally, um, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Kerry Karhelios, our guest uh, today. Um, Kerry is Assistant Professor of Computer Science and an internationally known expert on the design of online environments. Um, she directs the Social Spaces Group that I mentioned earlier uh, in reference to Matt. She recently won the prestigious National Science Foundation Early Career Development Award, and um, she holds a PhD in Media Arts and Sciences from the Media Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her previous work includes, um, to name one example, the design of systems that teach children with autism. So um, what I'd like to do now is to simply introduce our broad topic of do online environments and video games have a place in general education um, by talking a little bit about how we came to this. This will be a little bit boring for the people in the class um, because they already know some of this, but hold on. Um, we need this to, to help get the other people situated. Um, so to start off with, um, there are a number of occasions where we might already encounter video games and online environments in undergraduate education. Uh, just to name some of the most common examples, a number of programs are now experimenting with distance learning using online environments. Um, in our class, we've talked about Second Life in that way, and I know there have been some experiments on this campus with Second Life. Um, similarly, uh, some people use simulation in undergraduate education um, via video games as a method of reinforcement. So here on this campus, we have a, a simulation called Smog City that's used in atmospheric science. And the idea there is that there's an educational software uh, component to a class that directly reinforces the course material. So the goal is to play the simulation and learn the models that drive the simulation. And we also have simulation as a research method on this campus and, and elsewhere. So for example, um, statistics courses might, might use Monte Carlo. Um, economics might, might use Sugarscape. Computer science might use Peekaboo. So I just want to mention these in order to situate what we're doing, and that's actually quite different. What we're doing in this class, you might think of as critical use of a simulation. Um, we're not using a simulation that we designed. So we did not design a, a piece of software for our class that people then have to 
learn the models that drive it because that is our course material. Instead, what we are doing is we're using simulation in the way that some planning departments use SimCity. Um, so for example, European planning departments often assign SimCity, the popular video game, in order to teach people the foolishness of American assumptions about city planning. Um, so they read the game as something you can pick apart, not as a correct model of how to build a city. And so what we're doing is critical use of a simulation with the game Civilization IV. It's alright if it's a little faint, we'll get to that um, in a second. We've got a few goals of using this game in our class. First of all, we also want to teach the value of simulation as a method in social science. So the class is actually under consideration for general education credit in the social sciences, which means unfortunately everyone in this room doesn't get general education credit, so I'm sorry for that. Um, but it's under consideration. One of the goals of any general ed course is to teach method. And so we are interested in teaching method. We're also interested in, it's a course about media, so we're interested in reflecting on the role of video games themselves in culture and society a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, our objectives for this assignment are straight out of a, one of the more well-known books on active learning, Myers and Jones, 1993 book, Promoting Active Learning. They have a chapter in there on simulation that describes why an instructor might want to use a simulation in an undergraduate class. And the benefits um, that we were hoping for are really straight out of this early work on active learning. So for example, number one, student engagement. The hope is that there are some students who are not doing the readings or are not interested in the material who might be drawn in to a video game in a way that they wouldn't if we had done a traditional lecture or a discussion or a reading. Um, second, problem solving skills. Um, the idea of a simulation is that it, it often presents you, rather than with a series of steps that you have to complete, it presents you with a general problem and there are a number or an infinite number of ways to solve the problem. And so you have to weigh different strategies in order to figure out um, how to solve the problem that you're given. Um, you're also hoping for developing skills in synthesizing, so for example, making connections between disparate elements. Um, we're hoping for something that Myers and Jones called basic empathy. Um, in, in the sense that a simulation allows you to model unfamiliar perspectives and to try them out. Um, and also allows what they call advanced empathy, which is that you can do the same um, game but take a different perspective each time, um, therefore modeling what it's like to have a different perspective. And finally, um, we hope that the game would engage in multiple learning styles. So as pointed out earlier, um, some students in the class just aren't going to engage with some of the delivery mechanisms that instructors use for methods, even if uh, for, for teaching. And even if uh, everyone in class did the same reading, some students would get more out of it than others. And so the hope is that um, some students respond, um, respond much better to group exercises, simulations, and, and such. The class is a technology-intensive lower division undergraduate class. This is the class <coughs> website. Um, I'll the lights. Basically, the, the class actually already includes a number of technologies, and so I think the students in it are, are punch drunk by the time we get to the end of the class, because each week they have to do something new uh, in the class that has something to do with technologies. Um, overall, our, uh, our class has uh, an electronic system of submitting assignments, so uh, in the class every student has a blog, and they have to submit a weekly blog assignment instead of a, a paper. Um, and this is also straight out of the active learning literature, for those of you who are familiar with it, but. Uh, about, about journaling and student journals. Um, so what we did with the civilization for this class is that we, we started by recognizing that we had a unique opportunity in this game because it's a, a best-selling computer game for the PC platform last year. Uh, the game's goal is about domination of the world where you play the leader of a civilization. But the interesting thing for our class is that in the fourth version of the game, Civilization IV, the game actually includes a number of materials that have to do with communication and culture. So there's a culture model in the game, and you can do things in the game like uh, build the internet or uh, discover writing, and, and this directly relates to a lot of the material we cover in the course. 
So we take three weeks of the course at the end and we um, assign the weekly assignments that have something to do with the game. And so the game does not actually introduce new material in our course. It simply is a way of reviewing the material. And this is related to what I mentioned earlier as the critical use of the simulation. So the students are, our hope is that they play the game and then compare the game to the course material. And they say things like, does this game that I just played um, does it match or does it not match the material we've learned in this course? So that, in other words, the game functions not as a way of reinforcing the simulation itself, but as a test. So they look at the game and they use the game <coughs> to write about whether the, the game matches or doesn't match the course material, and they, they write about that. So um, in order to get the game to work in our class, we had to do a number of things. We, uh, the average game played of Civilization IV can take as much as a month. Um, so we started by modifying the game to remove features. So we removed a very large number of features from the game. Um, we didn't change the way anything worked. So if it was in the original version of the game, if it was in our mod, it would work the same way. We just removed a lot of features. Um, a problem that we had that I'll come back to is that uh, much of the game focuses on material that is not relevant for the course. And so this was our hope to remove a bunch of the material that wasn't relevant. Um, Generally speaking, I'd like to pick up on how the experiment has gone a little later when we hear from the rest of the teaching staff and the student work, but just to start that discussion, I'd just like to, to give my experience of some of the drawbacks of this so far. So we started off very optimistic about the goals that I gave you earlier in the class. The jury is still out. The final blog assignments are not yet due. We have a, a survey that we gave the students about their use of this game in the class, and the results of the survey are not yet in. However, um, I would just like to say that, uh, in some ways, I was really excited about this going in because, as you probably guessed, I love this game. Um, and that's one reason that I started playing, and that's one reason that I, I thought of using it in this class, because I had to encounter it before I could think of it as a class assignment. And I had high hopes for it, but of course, the literature on the scholarship of teaching and learning is fairly dismal when it comes to the use of educational technology in the classroom. I mean, a, a persistent finding is that Technology takes so much effort. If we had just spent the same amount of effort doing traditional approaches, so for example, take all the hours we put into this and use them to require students to meet with us individually for that amount of time, um, or just to prepare, to better prepare lecture or discussion, that we would get the same or, or better results than with the technology. And this is something I worry about because it did end up taking a vast amount of instructional resources to use a game in the class. Um, what we did is we asked the students to come in and, and use the game in a discussion section, thanks to the University Undergraduate Library Gaming Collection for helping us do that. Um, and then they had to come into lab hours after <coughs> class and play the game, and then each week for three weeks they wrote a short 250 word assignment relating the game to course material. So our big, a big problem I think is expense. Um, I know we haven't talked about this in class so far, but the computers in the lab all had to be upgraded in order to run the game, even though the game isn't new. They all had to have new video cards. We also had to pay for lab proctors, uh, although the, the library uh, absorbed that expense for us. Um, if we, we did not buy the software, um, thanks to the game company, uh, but if we did have to buy it, it would have been something on the order of $1,200 to $5,800 for the software used in this experiment. Um, then, of course, there's our labor in designing the game, which we could write off and say it's a one-time uh, one -time expense. But, but also, uh, there was a huge learning curve for this game, because the game has so many options in it that the students were often bewildered by it. We tried to get around this by making a movie um, that introduced students to the basics of the game, and by putting a, a few things in the game, like dialogue boxes, that would emphasize the course material. However, I'm not sure that worked very well. If we had called the movie Movie, it might have worked, but we called it tutorial. I think a lot of people just don't like doing anything called a tutorial. So they would immediately say, tutorial? That's not for me. Um, we also had a number of technical problems, which we could have anticipated some of them, but some of them came out of left field. Games are not that stable, especially games that use a lot of advanced graphics. Even if you run them on your own computer, they crash sometimes. And so as a platform in a lab environment, there were a number of technical problems. Um, we had logistical problems, finding lab times, um, and finally, a, a problem that we had that we knew about going in was that the game itself is racist, sexist, and focuses on a lot of themes that we would find objectionable, like war. Um, so just to give you one example of the many examples, some of these pointed out by students, um, there are portrayal, portrayals of world leaders in the game, and the world leaders from Western civilizations that are more familiar 
to our standard American audiences look somewhat like portraiture. They don't look that caricature. And this is my reading of it anyway. Whereas the farther away you go from Western familiar leaders, the more the characters look uh, extremely caricatured and strange. So for example, um, many of the female leaders are highly sexualized. Uh, this is Catherine the Great of Russia. Of course, there are historical reasons why she would flirt with you the way that this is, I, I guess. But still, it's a strange, uh, it's a strange way to teach historical material. Similarly, figures from other cultures just look sometimes downright bizarre. I, I think Gandhi looks like E.T. was a comment that he got um, from the class. And there are a number of other things in the game that are, that are worse, um, that were largely avoided, not because we took them out, but because our mod didn't focus on them. So for example, um, the treatment of indigenous people in the early part of the game is, is really amazing. Because it, whenever your civilization encounters an indigenous uh, group, the indigenous group, quote, volunteers to join your tribe. Which is an interesting reading of history. <laughs> what I'd like to do uh, now is to bring the lights back up and, and turn this over to um, the rest of our panel. Um, I'd like to, to start by just having Matt and Sid talk a little bit about their perspectives. And just so you know, I think we're running about five minutes behind on your schedule. But I'll, I'll send you the time signal. All right, please take it away. All right, one of our course subjects um, that we dealt with in the beginning of the course was the diffusion of technology. And in the classroom, um, I, mean, I can remember, I'm, I'm 30, and I can remember in elementary school we had 16 millimeter films. Uh, then when I believe the Challenger went up, we all watched that live on television, and then films became part of uh, education. And it became standard to include film and television. Um, just as you would the field trip into the day-to-day. The -day. Um, in the beginning of this assignment, and maybe it ties in with the uh, sort of student's anticipation for the learning curve, towards the learning curve, was um, a resistance to this game. Why are we playing a video game? Um, I'm not going to get anything out of this. Why is this important? What does this have to do with anything? Um, and because it's not an easy game just to sort of jump into, and it's not intuitive at first. You have to play um, many, numerous rounds of the game before you sort of can get a handle of what's going on and if you, you develop sort of some intuition towards your decisions, towards your actions um, within the game. Uh, the, uh, the best thing about being a PhD student for me with Christian is that we both like the same games. And uh, <laughs> we're both big fans of Civilization IV and when we started using this in class, the expectation I think that we had in common was that students would respond positively, that there would be a fun element in playing this game that would help them understand some of their readings and class material. Unfortunately, what we found was, at, at least from observations that we, uh, we had in, uh, in sort of lecture and from the reactions that we got, was that this was not seen as play, but it was seen as work. And that's a little unfortunate because, personally, I believe this game is very enjoyable. It was also a bestseller in 2005, so you would expect that a large number of students would react positively to this game, given its sales record. Um, and one way in which this manifested itself was that the amount of time that was spent was seen as a problem. Uh, we did a survey before we started playing the game, and the, uh, one of the questions on there was, how much time do you expect to dedicate to playing this game for the class? And the most common answers ranged between two and five hours a week. Uh, which is reasonable, but not as much as you might expect you know, college kids to spend on playing video games. And uh, especially uh, in terms of student engagement, we thought that uh, the game did not replace the readings. Uh, and we expected it to sort of help out in exploration, uh, so that you know, students would go around and try and figure out, okay, how's culture affected if I do this, or how you know, do I cause wars if I do that? or if I create a lot of hit movies and you know, distribute them, what happens as a result. Um, and this requires a lot of exploration. It requires people to spend time and experience the game multiple number of times. But um, the, the problem that we saw was that uh, play was seen in terms of time. And maybe one of the reasons for this is that there were 100 turns that were assigned within which they had to finish the game because we wanted so that they don't spend an infinite amount of time and can get to other things. Uh, that they would have a hundred turns to play what uh, we call the NS mod. Uh, and this was seen sort of like it's a six page reading or it's a two hour movie. And the hundred turns wasn't the end of it uh, because we expected or at least wanted that 
there should be a repeat that they play the game at least once or twice to try and figure out what's going on. And I think the sort of the end result of that, uh, at least from initial discussions that we've had, is that it's a bit difficult to encourage students to experiment <coughs> and to explore, which is probably one of the biggest things that you want to do in terms of a simulation. Uh, I think this is sort of a simple research idea that simulations require experimentation, uh, which probably means multiple trials. Um, and therefore, there's probably a structural issue in terms of students' allocation of resources, in terms of time that they spend on different assignments. And maybe another, maybe a response to this that uh, might be useful to consider is a sort of a realignment of incentives or uh, just a realignment of the way that students think about the way they allocate their resources, especially if they use non-traditional media, as Matt pointed out, not videos or books, but video games. And one thing, um, it, it, we just didn't play the game by itself, but each week we, there were several assigned readings that were tied into the particular assignment um, that was associated with the gameplay, how you were um, approaching the game and entering the game each week. So we did, it wasn't just a substitution for readings um, or for any other, or a lecture, but it, it was to incorporate these other components into the game. And in fact, uh, we have a sampling of some of those. Uh, Christian, do you want to tell us what the assignment No, no, I, oh, do I? Okay. Yeah, um, the, <laughs> yeah so the, sure. the overall assignment goals are actually um, related to that point I made earlier about critically using a simulation. So again, they had a number of assignments, but all three of the assignments about, si about simulation were requiring them to investigate the game, find out, or make a, a hypothesis, if you will, although we didn't use that word, about how the simulation is modeling something and then link that to course material. So we did that in three ways. The first way we did it, we gave them a list of features of the game and asked them to come up with the course material. The second assignment, we gave them a list of course material and we asked them to come up with features of the game. The third assignment, we asked them to modify a feature of the game um, so that it would better represent some course material. Um, so, so again, this is the point about critical reading. Um, and each week, the students had a weekly blog post anywhere between 250 to 300 words where they had to um, respond to these assignments. And we have a few testimonials from, or uh, excerpts from the uh, post. Uh, so from Blogger Double J, I have to say I hated this game at first. I was impatient and did not understand all of the complex steps that were involved. I was the girl who could never win a video game to save her life until now, Civilization IV. I knew that I had to break down the elements of the game to understand it better. My next few attempts at the game were a little more interesting. Um, I have one from someone who uh, blogs as Scene Kid and uh, asks, what is the relationship between technology and war? Thomas Hughes writes that wartime conditions are a catalyst for the production of new technologies. Is war the shortcut to cultural domination? <coughs> and on similar lines, Zoot Pseudonym says, Hughes says that governments are far more willing to spend money on infrastructure if it will help to win a war. I declare war on Genghis Khan. He was also notes in his essay that after wars end, civilizations try to keep up the pace of developing and implementing technologies. I could not test this in the game, I, as I was still at war when I ran out of time. That of course referring to those hundred turns that they had. Uh, from blogger Brown Nuts. Great artists and great works of art function to promote the cultural aspects of my country as well as an increase as well as increase my cultural points and international influence. In order for my country to create great artists and great works of art, I had to build a theater, a broadcast tower, the Globe Theater, and uh, Hermitage. Once I built these great artists such as Thespis, Balmiki, Kalidis, uh, what, they were born. These great artists then created the great works of art and thus dramatically increased my cultural points, cultural influence, political influence, the overall happiness among my population, and expanded my borders. The way this game depicts the numerous roles, great, <coughs> the numerous roles great artists and great works of art play supports Richard Dyer's arguments. And I have two which talk about rock and roll. Uh, one from WAG says, after a lot of early confusion as to what to do and when, I slowly began to understand a little more each time. I invented rock and roll, and I knew that there was going to be a technology needed to get it out to the world. In order to begin this process, I decided to build a radio tower in order to network the rock and roll out to other nations through radio waves. And Fender 236 writes, I was given the opportunity to invent rock and roll. Building this takes many turns, lots of time. But in doing so, I was able to get new artists in my civilization. And these artists create top hits 
which can give your civilization culture points. I think that this game says a lot about what we discussed in lecture when we discussed cultural imperialism. This basically states that you may not need to go to war if you can dominate the world's media space. There were many points where I could have declared war on other empires, but I continued to choose to remain peaceful, and instead of fighting them with guns, I continued to create new American media outlets. <laughs> Great, so um, next, I'd just like to turn it over to Carrie, Carrie Helios uh, to comment on this. So, um, okay. I was a big fan of, of Civ 1, Civ 2, um, back in 1996. Um, I had taken a break and then discovered um, Civ 4 again and heard about this class. And just so you know a little bit about um, my background, I've been participating in lots of debates about whether or not to use and how to use games in classrooms. And one of the things that infatuated me about this experiment was the idea of having it in the class and using it almost as a third object or a social catalyst in the class to inspire and to have a common ground for communication. So step one, I went and looked at the game, and um, not only was it called Civ 4, but it was Sid Meier's Civ 4, which, um, you know, this Sid Meier guy acted like, very prominently in his game. I put in the game, and the first thing that happens when you try the tutorial of the official game is Sid Meier comes up, very much like the world leaders. He kind of looks like Caesar and Gandhi, but he's up there sort of shaking and giving you the instructions for the game, so I was a bit surprised at how much he wanted to be involved in the civilization game itself. Um, that part was a little disconcerting to me, actually. But um, moving along and getting over that, one of the big problems I've had with games in the past, it, in the past for learning, especially in classrooms, is that so far they've been primarily used for people located remotely. Um, you don't get much feedback, especially if you know a professor actually tries to teach in this class. And um, even if you look at a lot of the writings by Howard Reinhold, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not you know, this is an efficient way to use this medium. Um, and I think it's possible. I don't think we've figured it out yet, but I think it's possible. Um, the potential of this course here, like I said earlier, and I want to restate, is that essentially um, you can use this game as a catalyst. The class also meets face to face. So even though you can start wars with people that you are fighting with, um, I don't know to what extent you've played the multiplayer versions, or when you talk about wars, you're fighting, you know, the computer itself. You guys want to answer that? Yeah, we, we did play the multiplayer once. You did? Yeah. One. Okay. Yeah, we had a, a technical error in one of the sections also, the multiplayer. So. Uh, okay. So when I was playing the game, I was playing the computer. Um, I, a lot of what I want to know is what it feels like to, to, you know, fight against your classmates versus, you know, to fight against the computer, which is very inanimate. But the benefit of using something like this in a classroom is one, you have everybody using the same game, everybody participating in the same environment, and then also meeting face to face and discussing this game. The more you play this game, especially with the steep learning curve, which I discovered the very first week, um, you know, people were laughing when I told them I was playing this game because I wanted to become more familiar and have something to talk about. And they were like, you know, yeah, you're doing research by playing a game. Um, they were kind of laughing. but. It was not easy to catch up in the beginning. There's a very, very steep learning curve. Um, so the more investment you put into the game of this shared object, um, I believe that the more close you feel to your classmates, and in many ways, it's in many, like the chick set me high, the investment into this psychic energy, he calls it this physical object. In this case, it's more of a virtual <coughs> object that people come together with. Um, so I believe in the long term, the class probably became more connected as a whole. And having something to talk about, um, I think makes a huge difference. If I give a class a book to read and say, please have this book read in one week, um, I suspect fewer people will have read the book than would at least try to play the game, especially with the assignments given. Um, with the simulation, I had a big problem. Um, one, because there's lots of different scenarios you can get um, socially from a macro versus a micro level. Um, even when you play SimCity, um, you know that if you raise taxes, certain things happen, but you still don't know what happens between two people, and the game doesn't really focus on that, and focuses on clusters of people at a time. You don't really ever get to see what happens as a relationship between two people form. Um, and part of what I think is important is seeing the difference between the macro level and the micro level. Um, I couldn't really figure out what the basic empathy parts to the game were, so I would like your input on some of that, um, because that was really hard for me to find. Um, the racist, the sexual undertones were very, very prominent in the game. Um, it's impossible to take that out. Um, the culture part of the game was also very, very frustrating to me. Um, as was the fact that 
for some reason today, I think all games are starting to look exactly alike. When I looked at this game um, back in 1996, it was quite different. Today, it looked to me just like Age of Empires, um, except for the turn-taking component, which in some ways made it cut the game and actually sort of break the illusion of you being in a game while you waited for something else to happen. Um, and then um, the Age of Empires crowd, developed by Microsoft, came out with Age of Mythology. The point of that being to infuse culture into the world. But instead what that did is, it sort of, you know, made mockery of religion, and you have to get through this religious phase before you can get culture. And I felt in this game that culture was too predefined. Um, you can have radio, you can have the internet. Um, I actually never got to the stage beyond what I know. It would be nice to actually get to the point when we could invent something new. Um, in the defense, game design is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult, and I'm not gonna, to see the games actually make it out there, you don't see the under, other 100,000 of games that don't actually make it to the marketplace. Um, what I would have liked to see more in this game is more signaling. Um, you can actually have some types of signaling in the way that you, you know, have wars, um, if you get to play with people over time. But what it really made me think about was how can you actually make more catered, more personalized interactions in this game, even in the way you fight war. Um, it made me wonder um, what the developers of this game defined as culture. I think that's what I left after playing this, what left with, what stayed with me after playing this game was, how do they define culture versus how I define culture? Especially with these predefined stereotypes, these predefined steps, these predefined intervals of time that you need to go through in order to get culture. Other things I would have liked to see are laws of attraction and how you understand laws of attraction in the model. And I'm going to stop there to give some discussion and then hopefully provide some more commentary um, along yeah. the way. Thank you very much, Kara. I think the last part that we don't want to forget is that this experiment is still going on. So the, the other people on the panel are in the audience and they're the class members for this class. You have the wireless one? Great. So um, what we'd like to do with the rest of the time is to ask the people in the audience to respond to any of the things that we've said. And particularly, I'd like to invite the people in the class to respond. I should say that um, I don't think that what I'm hoping for out of this is a, an evaluation of the game in the sense of I hated it or I liked it. I mean, if you'd like to say that, that's fine. But I'd also like something about um, why or about some of the other points that we discussed. Um, because after all, I, I guess a parallel would be I don't really pick the readings because I think that you're going to love them. Although maybe you do love some of them, that would be great. The point is that there is an educational objective to them. Um, so, uh, so let's go. Mark. Hi. Uh, I thought that it was educational, but I didn't feel as though the time that it took to be able to master the game and to also do readings to be able to make it educational was far beyond the constraints of the class. So I guess that the main thing to keep in mind is that it's an undergraduate course, like the under, under numbers of the spectrum. So it kind of was a time over, if you had an upper level class that was giving you more work, you had to kind of weigh your options as to where you were going to spend your time. So to be able to do the game and the required readings to make the game make sense in the educational confines of the class was almost a little bit too much for a lot of us. Let's get some more comments. Just a point on that, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think in many ways it would be interesting if you compared it with different types of games once it had a faster learning curve. So I think what you said in itself is actually a fascinating outcome of this in the sense that the steep learning curve in the beginning made it a bit harder to play. If this had been a different game, you know, or a flight simulator or something that you could pick up right away, um, would you have had the same effect? Maybe it would have been less interesting later on once you've mastered everything and had nothing else to talk about. But the idea of the specific game itself um, but also the idea that time is such a big factor in all of this. Um, and even the time it took for you to get to the stage in your academic career also. Uh, and if I could also just add a little bit to that, uh, while I do agree, in fact I said <coughs> something very similar when I spoke a few minutes ago. Um, at the same time, just from personal experience, I think this game is a lot easier than most other games. Because I remember trying to master Halo, and I was really bad at it. Because you have to know how to shoot and jump and climb and you know skip and do whatever else, and all at the same time. Uh, whereas in this game, it's more like you know I want this guy to do this, and then he go, goes does it for you. So it's more about a process as opposed to individual character movements. So from a dexterity point of view, it's a lot easier to learn in, in some way. <coughs> I agree with that. 
Uh, and you know, so that balances out just to add a little nuance. From. Well, let, let's. Uh, I mean, a point to make that we shouldn't overlook is that you didn't have to be good at the game. That was exactly. not a class yes. requirement. In fact, some of the, the good assignments were not from people who won the game, so they were, that was decoupled um, from the assignments. But I'd like to hear more from the class members. Don't embarrass me. Let's, let's have some hands. <coughs> we know a lot of people have been doing Um, I think the game as a social catalyst is a really like interesting point, and I would have, as far as playing multiplayer, just sort of experience from that happening. It seemed like a lot of problems with that were a lot of the issues you mentioned, like technically, but like, we had problems in section the first time when we tried to play multiplayer, and then some other problems with with sort of all that. I don't feel like we ever reached that point as a class, just because the, if you play multiplayer before you really get the mastery of the game. Then you're sort of sitting there and people are waiting for you to take your turn. And it's kind of you feel like you're rushed and you have to make a decision quickly and not really think about what you're doing and sort of move ahead before they can sort of take their turn and you feel like you're making them wait. And so there were some problems also with the timing, the way we could only we only went in on certain times. If you went and there really weren't a lot of other people there, there was only one or two and they had already started, there really was no opportunity to sort of set up the multiplayer. It would be nice to sort of reach that point, I think. If I could just say, uh, let's get a couple more comments from the students, really. I, I, okay. I, like I think um, a lot of it, personally, for me, to do with, with the placement of the game and the curriculum being at the end, um, when we were so used to just having readings and blogs, and all of a sudden the introduction of something new with the last, in, within the last three weeks of school also was kind of difficult in the sense that we had to, um, you know, come to, go to the library and the lab hours. And if we were introduced to that concept of the game earlier in the course, I feel like it wouldn't have had such negative effects. That's just my personal take. I think the game probably would have been better at the upper level class rather than the one at the nine level because there's too many um, like different groups of people together. Like, there were too many assumptions that, like, I personally don't know anything about video games. I've never played them in my entire life, and I'm kind of thrown to the wolves with the game. So maybe in the upper level class where there's more of, like, a specific, I don't know, mindset of the student rather than the first um, major um, groups of people in age group, it probably would have be been more beneficial for at least me learning a couple of people who have gone class. Since we're talking about using this game in under or in general education for undergraduate, I would think that it would be interesting to structure it like an introductory level cinema studies class where you would meet twice a week and then have a lab where in, in, instead of watching movies, you would play the game from 6 to 8.30, which is how cinema studies courses are structured. So I think that this game, you, you, could, make a, you could plausibly make a course at the undergraduate level, using that same kind of structure. It would be probably the, the time that you would use that on the game would be better. There was a couple of hands, yeah. You mentioned how it was, you use video games as an alternative to students who have difficulties engaging in like regular readings and whatnot, but I found out a difficulty engaging in the video game. Um, it was especially difficult to locate the relevant information for the class. Like, I don't have much experience with video games, so I didn't know exactly like where to look in the game. Like, when I read something, I, I have skills already that teach me, that that help me in locating the important information in a, in a reading or in a film, but not, I don't have those skills for a video game. Well, uh, one of the points I should make, I think, before we go on is just that one of our goals of this session is to decide if we'll ever do this again. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I'm hearing from everyone is actually a little different than I expected because I have to say, <laughs> Overall, the writing about the video game was the best writing of any assignment given in the class. I think that that was really at the expense of the low end of our curve in the class because I think that the students, a number of students just didn't turn in 
this assignment, the three assignments that have to do with the game. Uh, however, the students that, that did turn in, the writing was substantially better than a lot of the other, all of the other assignments in the class. And we'll have to wait until after the end of the class before we can think a little more carefully about the educational value. So um, I'm surprised because a lot of the enthusiasm from the writing is not coming out in the comments. Uh, and that, so that may be just that, um, just that it's not, you know, I don't feel comfortable saying these kinds of things. So. I think though that, I mean, it sounds to me like the comments that I'm hearing are all fixable kinds of things that they're giving you suggestions. You should probably identify yourself as not a member of the class. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a member of the class. Um, although I probably would have liked to have been. Um, but it sounds like, you know, for example, starting the, uh, starting the interaction with the video game much earlier in the class so that they have time to, to grow with it and become comfortable with it before they're actually doing assignments with it and things like that. So um, I actually think a lot of these comments are more along the lines of, of ways to improve it. So I'm, I'm not hearing of them as negatively maybe as you are, and I, I just wanted to interject that. Um, I personally have never like played video games, but I think that it is a good way to get other people involved. Because sometimes reading, everyone does readings for all their classes, and we all have a bunch of assignments to turn in. But like playing a video game is something that we don't really do, and it does give people a chance to like make like have their own decisions, like you said. Um, but like she said, it is a steep learning curve for the game, and it, it was really hard for me to grasp. And I still, I don't, I don't think I did grasp it at all. I was just, I just eventually decided clicking. So I think that, well, but just like, I, I mean, I still don't understand all the purposes of it, but to start it earlier and maybe to, like she said, like, I think that it is a good aspect of the class. You just need to work with it and maybe explain it better. Or just so people don't think it is as hard, because I think that's one of the main complaints, was it was really hard. I'd also like to invite people who aren't in the class to make comments or ask questions, and then we can wrap up as a panel at the end after we gather a few more. Thank you for running that. I found this game is very informative. I think that people would get a little bit more out of it if we had a little bit more of an introduction. And I think we can introduce some new technology such as the game in, uh, in, in learning. I mean, we're so used to, like I said, going to class, going to lecture, taking notes, doing reading, and that's it. When you get to do something as almost a radical idea, when you, we're going to learn the class by, or learn aspects of the class by playing, by playing the game, I think people were taking a little bit of that. And I think we're sort of thrust into it, like I said, the last three weeks um, of the course. But I think with the proper introduction, maybe going through the game um, once or twice during one of the lecture sessions, so everybody is sort of on the same page going into the game, oh, this is what we're going to have to do, this is sort of what we're, we're going to be learning uh, uh, through the game. I think people are going to have a lot better taste about uh, when they leave uh, the course, they well, you know, the game was interesting, it was a little bit difficult at first, but I understood it at the end, and I got a lot out of it. Um, I just wanted to add, I think that the students have like playing game that do with our different experiences like not all of us have had backgrounds in gaming or anything like that we played like smash brothers or something or nothing like yeah. a game where you had to uh, employ culture and things like that and i think one of the important things is that um, the game did force us to go out of our comfort zone and i think um anytime you introduce a new technology or a new aspect or a new form of teaching, method of teaching, it's going to face some resistance, like you said, but um, I think that over time, well, even just with me, like, doing blogs, if I played it more often, it did take more time, and that was hard, um, but it did end up having me understand a little bit more of the concepts of the class, so consequently, the blogs turned out to be better. I, I didn't see that, so. Thank you very much. I think we do have to end on time, so I'm going to ask the panel to wrap up. Um, if there are any comments you'd like to make. Um, well, one thing that I was very curious about, and that I'd like to pose as, as a question to the students maybe at the end afterwards, um, is this notion of revelation. Like, when you play the game and you try to discover the model of civilization, you know, what was this, 
exploration, what was this notion of discovery like um, when you did come up with a theory and then try to test it? Because I think that's very valuable. Um, for me, what made me very excited about this class was all the stories that people wrote about it afterwards. So in that sense, I see it as a big success in that you have people write these amazing commentaries, these amazing stories, and this whole experience of the class turns into this narrative where people talk about their discovery of rock and roll, where they talk about you know, their discovery of, of the internet or radio. Um, so I think in that respect, um, this building people together, I think, was fascinating. On a different note, I was just wondering how United the class felt after taking this class. There are some studies that show that people bond together over dislikes rather than likes much more. And just curious, curiosity is that maybe the fact that everybody was frustrated, maybe you brought everybody more together. Just They've been through the war. And um, um, just a few other questions that I just am pondering right now is, were some people in the class sort of like the ones you'd go to for help? Or did you get to know people in the class more based on experiences by playing this game and get to know your classmates better? Because I think in that respect, um, no matter what game you play, um, you have the, the benefit of also having face-to-face -face time as well as having this virtual time playing this game. And I think that's an opportunity you don't get in many of these experiments with um, using games in education. So I guess to summarize my point and then hand off the conversation, I think the reflection um, it's probably one of the biggest um, deliverables you'll have of this game. Um, again, I would like to know a little bit more about the, the process of discovery and the models of culture that you came up with. Um, and again, just this notion of connection in the classroom. Um, one, observation I want, one observation I want to make very quickly is that um, I mean, we proctored numerous um, lab hours and there was a, a, consist a consistent group of students um, most of them here right now, who were there in the lab hours ran in three hour chunks. And they were there from you know the, the moment the lab opened until it closed. And there were also the students who were most likely to help other students. If there was only one of us in the lab, that it didn't perform as a local social catalyst that you know people helped each other, people talked about it. Um, there was also an increase, I think, in the discussion, at least one-on-one -on -one with a blog assignments where previously uh, students didn't approach you to talk about as often about an assignment that they might not understand or you could sort of reiterate that same assignment 10 or 15 times. Um, and I thought that was, uh, as sort of the, the TA's perspective, it was an uh, interesting component that wasn't present in the previous design. So do you have one sentence? Yes. Uh, I actually do in my one sentence. <coughs> Excuse me. My, my one sentence is that just this guy you said, uh, that was a tremendous improvement over time in the positive reactions. Initially, people didn't like it, but at the end of it, they did. And I think we're seeing some of that in the reactions today. Thank you very much.